Hey everyone and welcome back to the United Star. I'm Atanu Vadva and I have with me Andy who's a big Manchester United fan. He goes to all the games and you know he gives me some gossips, he gives me some anecdotes about the games. So welcome back to the channel Andy. It's a pleasure to have you here. And this time hopefully I'll not confuse you with John. I'll not call you John, I'll call you Andy. So welcome back to the channel Andy. Yeah, that was great to be here. Yeah, obviously we do a lot of work with all the United Women, which you've been uh, being our Indian representative on for for quite a while now. So it's great, to, great to come on your home turf as well. Yeah, definitely, Andy. And you know, just before uh, I begin the video, why not subscribe to All for United WFC? I've I've been on the fans forum a lot with Andy, and you know we've become good friends uh, since that. And you know, anything you want to talk about the women's football, anything you want to know about women's football. One stop destination is all for United WFC. I know we are also trying to do some content, but uh, at the same time, uh, my inspiration is all for United WFC, and that's why you know I, I try to inculcate some of the some of their uh, things into our channel as well. So subscribe to their channel. And now, Andy, Manchester derby, the last game, a two-two draw. I think uh, we should have won because this was the best time to face City. Uh, they were a weekend side, and they were down to ten players. Uh, bad tackle by Georgia Stanway, but we talked about that in the review. So, what were your thoughts, Andy? Like, I'll be honest, I was a bit disappointed because I really wanted to get those three points. But what were your thoughts about the game? Yeah, there's a very famous quote by Vince Lombardi, which is that a draw is like kissing your sister. And what what he what he means by that is it's a weird, you know, it's you're not got the ecstasy of victory, you've not got the like utter despair of defeat. You just sort of a bit. Sort of like, you know, you just sort of like it's it's almost like it's one of those really. I mean, when when the whistle went at the end of the night ninety, 90 minutes, uh, I was disappointed because when you go down to ten, you know, we've got to got to have, uh, you know have won at that point. Um, and as you say, even before that, you know, City were very very depleted. Um, you know, we we brought a lot of noise, got a lot of atmosphere. It was, you know, it, it was a big game uh, atmosphere. It was a big game occasion. It was on, you know, BBC One, which is the national broadcaster over here. So it would have got a lot of eyeballs on it rather than just being Sky or on the FA player. Obviously, it was being shown internationally for you guys as well. Um, so I was disappointed. However, some people have been working on me since then. And, I, and I've slept. And I've sort of gone through my sort of five stages of grief. And I've now realised that actually, if you'd, if you'd said at the beginning of the season, we'd take a draw with City, you probably would. I know they're currently ninth. They were ninth before yesterday. And, you know, it's, um, you know, it's possibly something that we should have won, but it's a long season. And if we're honest, the best chance we've got going forward is getting third place in the league, the Germans of the Champions League. And there is a massive difference between fourth and third now because of that. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, right now as well, I, I'm watching the table because the games have just finished. The match week is over and Man City are still at the ninth position with four points. United are in, in, in the fourth position with 10 points and uh, the third placed Tottenham Hotspurs are with uh, 12 points. And hopefully uh, when the international break ends uh, on 7th of November, we face Tottenham and we win that and we're in the top three. And hopefully we build upon that and you know, aim for the title because, you know, I know uh, people might call me deluded and, you know, might call me stupid because of thinking that we have a chance of winning the title. But at the same time, I think this squad deserves to win something, be it the Conti Cup, be it the FA Cup, be it the FAWSL. And why not aim for the FAWSL? Because when you aim for the title, then only you'll be, you'll be able to finish at the top three. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I mean, I, I'm the same. I mean, you know, we, I was watching the forward bated breath when uh, Chelsea for a long, long time were, were drawing nil nil with Leicester, and um, you know, and, and I was hopeful that because that would help us out in the title race. But obviously, in reality, I said to one of my friends, and they were like, it "Doesn't really affect us as much as you think," you know. Um, I mean, we might go on to this looking at obviously the Conti Cup. I think it's a vastly undervalued comp competition. Uh, mainly because it doesn't exist in the men's game. It's not like most other competitions are equivalent. The Women's Champions League, Men's Champions League, Women's FA Cup, Men's FA Cup. But this is kind of a weird hybrid, basically between the kind of like between the Europa League and and the, uh, and the Carabao. If the Europa League and the Carabao had a baby, 
kind of situation with a bit of a weird group at the stage and a knockout, but then more Europa because people don't really treat it like they do a league game or an FA Cup game. They put look at their reserves and they look at their development players um, more than anything else. Um, so it's a strange one for people to having to understand what it is. Uh, and I think, you know, even the league in this country could do with United going far in the Conti Cup because it would get more visibility for it. I mean, so far, you know, the last couple of years, even pre-COVID, it's it's like, it's a joke, basically. So they do the semi-finals, and then about a week before the bloody final, they then tell you which random men's stadium it gets played in as a final. So how can you sort of, like, build up to a final and sort of get the numbers in? And, be, uh, and because of that, or they do another thing where they can, you can allow people to book early, so you end up with a, like a group, a load of neutrals, and you haven't got that sort of atmosphere between United and whoever or Chelsea. You, know, you haven't got that sort of situation. I think the last couple of years, it, what, it was played in Nottingham Forest and it was played in right, Bramall Lane in Sheffield and just random men's stadiums. They're not particularly, I'm not saying Wembley because you're not going to get 80,000, but just a little, it feels a little bit like you get a dartboard and just throw it against the, the map and like, oh, we'll play there then the final so I think if we did go far maybe if we win the Conti Cup then it might reinvigorate that competition and as you say it would give us a lot of confidence um, to say that we're making progress if we hit fourth again on paper that's the same as last year even though we are developing yeah I think uh, let's be practical I'll be realistic that uh, I see us going into the top three Uh, as a United fan I want us to win the league but realistically, I think third or fourth would be good enough because we are in a rebuilding stage. A lot of players have left, and we got we have have a, have a good quality of players as well. But we need to have we need to make some tweaks. Mark Skinner need, needs some rec, uh, you know needs to make some recruitments in the forward line, which you have been a big advocate of getting the forward line uh, uh, more more depth in the forward line, and hopefully in January or in the summer window we get them and you know, go again next season or maybe this season as well. So, I agree that this trophy, this silverware would be very, very good for the morale of the team as well. But coming back to that Manchester derby game, Alessia Russo and Lucy Staniford, amazing. Ella Toon getting mm-hmm. another assist. Hannah Blundell, three assists in two games. We've got good quality and we we are seeing people, you know, we are seeing that intent to score. We are seeing that intent to win games. But this was one off game, and I'm really, you know, I, I'm sad, but I'm really gutted for Mary Herbs because I'll be honest, amazing saves. Player of the mm. match for me was Mary Herbs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that save that she did uh, quite early on, where she was sort of at full stretch and she just sort of tapped it from, from, from the side. I mean, that's very, that, that, that's, you know, that's, you know, that sort of highlight real stuff. You know, as I said, the England manager was in the in the um, stands to be honest if I was Mary I'd get that printed off and give her a signed signed picture of it because that's like the best advert to say yeah keep me as number one and with Ellie Roebuck out still she's got a good chance of actually nabbing that nabbing and keeping because of the way goalkeepers work on performance and momentum uh, that, that England number one jersey you know and if she could keep it this year then oh look she could end up as number one in the Euros because it's very hard even when someone was back from injury, and Ellie Roebuck in the past was better than Mary Earps, even much as it hurts me to say that. Um, but it's hard to switch a goalkeeper because of the way it works with confidence in that position. I mean, that might be something that we might look at when we go into Durham because, you know, because it's seen as more of a development thing. Not on paper, it's not a development competition. It's just the way sort of the unwritten rule of the league is that people put their sort of squad players or the development players into the cup initially. When they get to the quarterfinals and the semifinals, then they put in sort of the big guns to try and get over the line. But obviously, we could see Sophie Bagley. We are proud to say we probably most likely are going to see Sophie Bagley, um, you know, at Durham. Um, and I uh, said so, so she won't be playing then. But generally, you keep as your keeper unless they get injured. And if they get, and then if you look at the history of most keepers, even in the men's game, you know, De Gea, I know he's been switched out a little bit, but. Um, you know, some of the famous um, Buffon going back a bit in the Italian league, they all got their chance by being the, the goalkeeper on the bench when X got injured. 
and they had to come on. That's how the goalkeeper gets their career going in a way. Um, when they were, uh, and uh, so I think hopefully Mary will keep her position as, as England's number one. Yeah, that would be perfect. And you know, like you said, uh, playing as the number one goalkeeper in the Euros would definitely be a morale booster. And uh, Sophie Bagley, Emily Ramsey, Fran Bentley would, you know, take inspiration from, from Mary Ups and do even better. And there's a good competition. And, you know, uh, you, you said that Sophie Bagley might start. I really want Sophie Bagley to start because she was amazing last season for Bristol City. I know Bristol got relegated, but, uh, you know, that's not solely based on Sophie Bagley's performance. The whole team uh, failed uh, to, 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 you know, to deny relegation. But at the same time, Sophie Bagley, amazing addition to the team. So hopefully she'll start. But uh, Andy, what were your thoughts about that Alessia Russo and Lucy Stanford game yesterday? I mean, it was great to see uh, see Russo um, score. I mean, it's a great goal. Um, obviously, Lucy is a bit more uh, not scrappy, but not as not as sort of picture perfect. But they all count the same. And I think it was great to see her score. It was the first time she did the full ninety, Alicia Russo. Um, you know, obviously, I was with a lot of people who one particularly was very knowledgeable of the fact of her career in in U- U.S. college. And as she was apparently a goal machine when she was over there. And she is, again, still really young. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm advocating more strikers, but that's not because I want Lucy, Lucy Russo to sit on the bench. It's because I think currently she's got a lot of pressure. She's like pretty much the only striker that we have officially, uh, an out-and-out striker. I mean, I know Martha Thomas is also there, but she's currently injured at the moment. So that's a lot of pressure. You know, and obviously, the position, especially when you come to a defined striker, you are relate, you are reliant on delivery and service. So sometimes you can have a bad game because you're not getting the service. So it's almost like you know, it's a balance like that. I think she did really well. I love that image. I think it's gone around on social media when, when you know, she did score and the sort of like you know, she was on her knees and she sort of like, you know, and that's the passion that we had as well as fans. Um, and I think, you know, the noise, I mean, I don't know what it was like on TV, but the noise when that goal went in and we were 2-1 up, to be honest, it was probably that's what the problem was because that's why, you know, when, when they got an equaliser, I felt a bit more, you know, you know, a little bit more down because I've just gone from, like, ecstasy downwards and it took me a while to think, okay, you know, 2-2 is not that bad. Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, Toto isn't that bad, but at the same time, they were down to 10 players. And I really thought that they, these three points would uh, would definitely, you know, maybe not definitely, but, you know, uh, cement our place in the top three uh, for the coming months. But mm, we are Manchester United uh, and we we do try to, you know, make it difficult for ourselves. <laughs> if, if that's... Yeah, the- no, I mean... It- I mean, we were, we, as I said, we were just surprised initially that the red was given, even though it's evidently a red. If you look at it, you know, you can look at it from space and it's clearly a red. Um, but, you know, there is this thing in the women's game and it doesn't necessarily mean if it's a woman woman ref or a male ref. A lot of female ref, female players get away with murder because there is this almost inbuilt assumption of they didn't mean it. If there's a big violent tackle, because typically women aren't violent. And I'm not saying that Georgia Stanley meant it, but it wasn't like it, you know, if it was a, if it was if it was George Stanway, you know, and if it was a Premier League game, it would be red all day long, and that would be in a conversation. Uh, and, I, and I was interested that Gareth Taylor said it, you know, maybe it was a yellow. I think I initially I thought that she would get a yellow because obviously we didn't see it that much from the sideline; we just more heard it. But and I was shocked. That it was red, but I wasn't shocked because, um, you know, that she gave a red and I thought it was wrong. I was shocked because there was a red card tackle and the referee gave a red. Yeah, I think uh, you're right that, like, I, I've I've been watching women's football for a year now and I, I too haven't seen many red cards, but that was a red card and, you know, I'm glad that the referee got it right. Lines woman was... Yeah, and, you know, this, and it, it, uh, yeah, yeah, go on. No, it was a great, you know, and it was it was a great day and it went really, really quickly. And, you know, it was it's exactly what we did what we look forward to in football, isn't it? You know, it was a 
you know, a derby game. We were, you know, there was some City fans there. Um, you know, just like the men's, it, the attendance was a bit weird. There was apparently 150 City fans there. Well, there's 150 City fans there. I'm a ballerina. I doubt that. I don't think there was 150 City fans there. I think there's a bit less. Um, but they, you know, they had the little drum. They tried the little best. Person. And, uh, you know, they uh, they did their little thing, but we certainly showed them. Um, and as I say, you know, obviously, a bit on social media this morning, I noticed, because um, obviously we recorded this on, on Sunday, um, that, you know, apparently Georgia Stanway did get abuse over the, um, the tackle against Leah Galton. Uh, any actual abuse, obviously, I'd condemn, you know, in the strongest possible terms, um, you know, but as I say, I, I didn't, you know, I follow a lot of Man United fans, uh, Man United women fans on Twitter. I'm active on Twitter myself. Um, and I certainly didn't see anything that I would constitute as abuse from my, from, as a, from myself or from people that I know. Whether or not, because it was on the men's side, you had a couple of trolls that maybe had a little look at a video and decided to be a bit, you know, keyboard warrior That's the only thing I can think of because certainly out of the United fans that I know, both internationally and who go to the game, you know, we wouldn't abuse player. Um, and, and I think they also do stroke, you know, there's a slight issue there because if you look at the video, she goes into, uh, into Leah, immediately apologises, then tries to go for her again. So, you know, it's one of them. But I think, um, I think that, to be honest, um, you know, we are getting there. With, with with our support and with our views, but we do sometimes have a bit of a unfriendly press on this side because United, even the men's side, I believe, I don't follow it as clearly, um, everyone's very happy to criticise United and very slow to support them. Um, best example of that would be people saying, you know, United's uh, main Twitter should have supported the women's team earlier. Then they, did send, then they did send a tweet out and there was no, like, well done. You know, you can you can you can do the criticizing, but you can't do the other thing. But and the only one that they mentioned, and I, I'm always doing it now, but this is another part of the reason was, you know, they were mentioned about Alex Greenwood getting booed. And as I said to somebody who I'm no longer contacted with really on Twitter, booing is not abuse. Booing is not abuse. Booing is is part of the attraction, apparently. I'm not a player, but according to all uh, opposition players, you listen to men and women get interviewed about quieting the crowd. You know, the opposition team, if they score, they want to quiet the crowd. As a referee, they like that because it's part of the challenge of refereeing. We booed Alex Greenwood because she was our captain and she went to Leon for money and then she went to, went to Man City. And she's played for every single team you can think of. And you can assume there's, there's less loyalties there. Yeah, if I sit there and work out, that's because the women's um, stadium, the women's salaries are a lot lower, and you maybe have to have more monetary considerations. But it's it's just football, you know. That's just football. Yeah, and that's something that uh, you know. I, I think she saw it coming when she signed Man City. She signed for Man City, uh, and now she's captaining their side as well. So of course, we we feel bad. But, uh, you know, as you said, booing isn't a views. I absolutely... No, it's, yeah. Honestly, it's not. I mean, I don't know if you have them in India, but they have things called, uh, like, children's pantomimes, where they take you to, like, kids go to the theatre and they get them to sort of, like, cheer and hiss at various characters. You know, it, it, it's not abuse. Swearing is abuse. Threatening people is abuse. You know, making comments about their characteristics, personality, that's it. But a boo is just, it's just part of the, as I say, players do thrive off it. Um, and but I did notice that. But as I say, I don't want to conflate the two, even though they're not the two of them have been mixed. Uh, Georgia Stanway, you know, bad tackle, red all day long, player violent conduct, in my opinion, at least a free match ban. And um, maybe it might not be that um, because of the way it works in the women's game. But um, but at Greenwood, nah, she 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 got what what she she should have expected in the derby. Ah, yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that, that also, that was something that we didn't actually pick up on on the day. We've seen that later on, obviously, a lot of clips. Um, and obviously, as I say, we booed her without knowing that. So, you know, God knows what would have happened if you had like a big screen and we could see, you know, exactly what that was. Um, 
yeah, again, very dangerous. You know, that, that's your voice box. You can easily damage somebody quite easily doing that. That also would be a straight red if somebody found it. But again, it wasn't given, arguably because it was against the United player. So for the viewers, I, I didn't actually explain the gesture. I wasn't trying to threaten Andy or anyone. Uh, it, it was that uh, when, I think it was Lucy Staniford who scored the goal, the equaliser, 1-1. Uh, Ona Bhatia went for the ball, but uh, Alec Greenwood decided uh, to, you know, uh, pick up the ball and give it to the referee so that they can begin kick, uh, they, they can begin the kickoff again. Uh, Ona Bhatia didn't agree with it. And Alex Greenwood, I think it was an involuntary action or an impulse decision, whatever it was. Maybe it was voluntarily, but uh, she, she decided to do this. So I think uh, if the referee caught it, it has to be a minimum a yellow card. But if uh, you are comparing it with the men's football, I think it should. This was a red card. So yeah, it was. A, I mean, I've seen only seen it a couple of times, but I didn't see it much as a grasp. It was more of a shove, which is actually more dangerous because if you push against your voice box, yeah. And no, I thought you were using it as a uh, as a sort of memory to remind me that yeah, it, she was she she wasn't white and white, and she wasn't she um she did uh, she did do a few things that that were definitely not good in the game. Yeah. So, Andy, now moving on to the Durham game. Of course, uh, we have to learn from our mistakes. We have to, you know, continue scoring goals. We need to uh, pick up the positives as well. But overall, we need to improve our game and, you know, we'll, we'll learn from our mistakes. Durham in the Conti Cup, uh, first match day. We are in a group which consists of Durham, Manchester United as well, uh, Manchester City, Everton, and I think it's Leicester City. So, five yeah. teams. Uh, first game against Durham uh, and after that there's an international break. Uh, we have played against Durham three times, uh, two times in the championship. Uh, the first game was a 0-0 draw. The second game, I think United lost 3-1 if I'm not wrong. And there was yeah, a Conti Cup, game, uh, Conti Cup game which we won 1-0. So, Andy remembers the 3-1 loss uh, and he'll try to give us an anecdote now. Yeah. Yeah, gather around for a story that's almost as scary as Halloween. It's a place called Durham. Now it's um, it's one of those. Obviously, you, anyone you might not pick up it so clearly on the TV. You will now with Sky and BT. But one of the uh, with Sky and uh, BBC One. One of the uh, things uh, that we try and do is we use a lot of the men's chants, and we sort of like like you know to make it more women. You know, make it more applicable to the women's game. So, uh, obviously, there's a particular chant in the men's game, which people might have heard from more traffic. There's a lot more people, and it gets picked up on the, on the, um, on the cameras a lot earlier, uh, earlier. but it's, um, we, we, all hate, we all hate lead scum, which is just repeated at the end. Um, what happens in the women's game is that we now say we all hate Durham. And the, the reason why that happens is, you know, obviously, first season of the championship, we're in the championship, um, we were actually quite disliked by a lot of the women's football establishment and certainly by the existing women's football uh, fan base. It's got a lot, lot better. I think we've won a lot of arguments over that. And I think people have started to, you know, the, there's an old English saying about how imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So we started doing songbooks. Now Chelsea's doing songbooks. Now, now, now Aviva's, now Aston Villa's singing. You know, it started to, we're starting to get that a bit more atmosphere. I mean, not anything in compared to what we do. Um, but, you know, it, it is starting to become a thing. So we were in our first year in the championship. We went up to Durham away. Uh, Durham is about a hundred, you can probably convert it into kilometers, but it's about 130, 150 miles away from Manchester. Um, but it's also, it's in the northeast of England. So it's, it's not nice roads. It's not easy to get to. It's multiple motorways and a bit of an A road at the end. So it's, you know, whereas you might see United fans go straight down to Birmingham or go down to London, you think, well, that's a lot further. Well, it is, but it's a lot easier to travel it. It's up and down, there's a lot more um, facilities and it's just a nicer, nicer journey. Um, so we went to Durham. It was cold. I think it might have been around this time of year, actually, maybe a bit later. And we went there and... You know, we, we just we didn't see anything different initially. It was a, they played at um, New Ferns Park. Uh, now they've changed their, I'll say it loosely, stadium. 
um, because it's not really a stadium, it's basically a field and a stand. Um, from New Feds Park to, to a castle near Durham University, it's called Manson Castle, I think it's called. And you know, it was on an artificial pitch. We played there and we just did our thing. It was, you know, we were sort of like, like with, um, you would have seen this season with, um, with um, Rangers. We were standing at the side of the pitch. We had like these big uh, wooden boards and we were sort of banging the boards and making a lot of noise. But for some reason, it became evident after a few minutes that everybody in Durham were acting like I've just like, you know, just got just sort of to use an Americanism, just sort of broken, kicked down your door in the middle of Thanksgiving. Like they were like just really unhappy with what we were doing and our behavior in very commas. And then Durham also uh, on the pitch are a bit like Reading. Um, they're very, very physical. Um, and, but I'd actually go, so I'd go a bit further with Durham and say they're basically dirty, um, you know, in that respect. Uh, and yeah, okay, they, they won 3 1. And there was a particular, there was a penalty that was that was given, uh, you know, against us uh, that that they converted against Siobhan Chamberlain, who was in that at the time. And I remember the um, when the penalty went in, uh, the whole number of players, that whole dozen players, and sort of a group, sort of swarmed over to us and sort of were like doing that, and were like going, you know, come on then, which now we love, which is great. But like there was 900 people there. There was about 15 of us. And I remember turning around to someone and saying, Do you ever get the feeling that you're being watched? You know, it's uh, it was what it was one of those. And as soon as it ended, yeah, we were like out of there after speaking to some of the players and stuff. But and then there was some stuff on social media saying, Oh, you know, we were used to making lots of friends with the way fans and Atlanta, but United are folks and that kind of stuff. And, and we're not, we're not, you know. We, we we do exactly what you see on TV. It was it was exactly what it was. But it was again. It was like we want to grow the game because we want to provide a passion that is the reason why everybody wants to play football in the first place. You know, I've said before on all of United and other areas as well. And um, you know, use the example of watching the Champions League as a child. Lauren James, our ex-player, has a brother called Reese James. I'm sure they both watch football together, and, and you know, as children, and I'm sure. You know that they would then imagine scoring the winner for whichever team, you know, United, Chelsea, whatever. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean, you know, you should be denied that fact. And until recently, that's what was happening, because it was kind of viewed that women's football was like a family affair where you can't make noises, you can't criticize the players, you can't have an atmosphere. No little girl, no young woman is going to dream about scoring the winner with an empty stand and a few people going, just like Reese James, they're gonna, they're gonna imagine the roar of the crowd when they score the winner and the scenes like you saw when we went 2-1 up against um, against uh, City this weekend at the time. And that's what I'm proud of. But yeah, Durham is a bit of a bogey team because of that. They're a bit of a team that on paper we should steamroll. On paper it should be, you know, almost like a footnote in the United season. Um, it shouldn't really have much, much sort of history behind it. It shouldn't have much law behind it. But for for us fans, Durham is a is a team that we really want to beat, and we've never been back since because obviously we got promoted out of the league, and we've not we've not had them in the Continental Cup or the FA Cup since. So this is like three years in the making. Yeah. And uh, we have scored two goals against them. One was in the winner uh, in the Conti Cup one nil win, in which Molly Green scored. And the second goal was by our very own number seven, Ella Toon, who who is on fire. Uh, she scored in that three uh, one loss to Durham uh, in the in the championship away game. So Andy, like I'll ask you, uh, consider that we are going into an international break. Uh, so first of all, that was a brilliant anecdote. Uh, let me just tell you, of course, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, sh- show support to our team. And I think uh, when the players instigated you, 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 you would be feeling a bit awkward because uh, that's something that doesn't actually happen a lot. And uh, <laughs> like when, when you said uh, that uh, it, it seems like we are being watched, uh, <laughs> it, it, it definitely should have, should have felt like that because the opposition players are instigating you and telling you come. 
do it again. Do it again. Yeah, yeah, that was just it was it was great to see. I wasn't on panel with that. There is probably still pictures on their faces. It was it was great. The the are you being watched was basically that the, the fans were just like quite stern and silent towards us. That that's what I was referring to. That I don't want to mix the two together. Okay. Um, yeah, um, you know, as I say, there was a famous bit where we won, I think, uh, pre-COVID against Leicester nine uh, one. And, you know, their player did that towards the fans. And we like that. That's what we want. We like that. But no, it was more of the fans, as I say, for some reason, they really disliked Durham. And as I say, if you, if you and Durham dislike us, if you look at the sort of geographical nature of where we are compared to Durham, unlike the Derby, there isn't really a reason for us to have a rivalry with them. They haven't got a men's side. They don't have a history with playing against United, like obviously most of the teams do. So I suppose that's why it adds another interesting element to it because um it's a, it's kind of like we're a very young squad at, and a very young team as a, as a women's team uh, but it's like our first rivalry because we've caused it to be a rivalry rather than it's a rivalry for historical reasons yeah definitely and you know uh moving on to the last segment i just wanted to ask you how do you think mark skinner would pick his starting 11 because considering that we are going into an international break he might start the same team that started against uh, Manchester City, maybe. Making that one odd change where Sophie Bagley comes in because I think it's time that we see Sophie Bagley play in a United shirt. I actually think he's going to make a lot of changes, but not because of what happened at the weekend, but because, as I say, the way the Conti Cup is viewed. So you're looking at Sophie Bagley. Uh, if Kirsty Smith is fit, I think she's going to play. Um, you know, I mean, there will be some of our sort of first team that we'll have to say because of um, you know Jeez. the depth we haven't, we haven't got the depth I think Kirsty Smith would play I think um, you know uh, Hannah Bundell would play Honor might get might get rested uh, as well um, you know if, um, Maria will play as well um, midfield Z- um, Zellam's going to get a rest I think um, I mean you know <laughs> Arguably, I think she should have had a rest this weekend as well. I'm not a fan of Katie Zellam at the moment. I think that currently, as I said, we've been tying ourselves in knots to try and accommodate her in the midfield because but she's simply not performing and she's currently being protected by the armband by being captain. Um, but yeah, I would say Hayley Ladd will play and she'll start. Um Two reasons. Number one, she needs game time. Number two, she's a physical player. She'll be a good um, and a, a good antidote to Durham's physicality as well. The Haley lad, Lucy Staniforth, will start. Um, also, I would say, um, I don't even know where, where Villa Bodarisa as well. She's midfield, I think, isn't she? Um, and or Jackie, but again, I don't think Jackie's going to start. I'm really thinking about a squad team here that you're going to see a big difference. And I would say maybe even Ivana and Kerry Jones. We are going to put out a squad team. Uh, I don't, and I know that's a lot weaker than you would necessarily expect us to put out. But as I say, it's the way they treat the Conti Cup a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong. Tuna, Ella Tuna will be on the bench. Russo will be on the bench, I'm sure. Or it will be a get us out of trouble if needed, job for them. Whereas I think certainly for Carrie Jones and definitely Ivana, it would be a way where they could show their talent and um, hopefully looking towards the Spurs game. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so I think uh, I, I agree with your uh, starting eleven. I think we might see uh, Kirsty Smith or Martha Harris start. I think Ona will, will get the rest. I forgot about Martha, actually. Yes, yeah, so you could put Martha Harris. Martha Harris. Um, Kirsty Smith, uh, Hannah Blundell, and um, and Mannion, basically. Yeah, me give, give a rest to one of the centre backs. Me, that's what you're yeah. trying to say. So yeah, yeah. I I agree with that. Uh, I, I agree with the back four. Like I I mentioned that uh, considering it's a, a international break, Mark wouldn't make some changes. But as you said, it will be it will not be fair to the squad players if they don't get game time against Durham. So. It's just what happens. It's a weird thing. As I said, it's not badged as a development yeah, that, league. Or a the same thing happens in men's do. football as well. Like in the cup games, you play your squad players as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, yeah, so that's... I, I agree with your back five. The goalkeeper, Sophie Bagley, Kirsty Smith, Martha Harris, 
uh, either one of Eva Manuel or Maria Torres daughter starts uh, and Hannah Blundell. She hasn't done anything wrong, uh, and you know she's been doing really well. And considering uh, that she might not go on the international duty, I, I think it'd be wise to start her uh, in the fullback position. Midfielders, you know my stance on Haley Lad. I really want Haley Lad to start. So Haley Lad, Wilde Borisa, and I think the third uh, midfielder will be Lucy Staniforth. Um, same, same as your team because uh, you know I'm inspired by your team. <laughs> so Ivana Fuso, Carrie Jones, and I think. I think I'm. I'm not too sure, but I think Leah Galton starts. It'd be interesting because I think one of the people who does play will be um, maybe, possibly, hopefully, in my opinion, audition for captain. I doubt he's going to get rid of Katie's and as captain. In my list is more wishful thinking, but I'd be interested to see who would be captain if Katie's not on the pitch. Because I don't I think, think that's been. I think it. It will be Haley Ladd because I think it was the Rangers game where she. She had the armband, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I can't remember, to be honest. Uh, yeah. chances, and maybe, but again, she doesn't play that often either. So I don't know. I, I would, I would say you would have you give it maybe to one of the sort of. Uh, I mean, I would have given it to Leah, but you don't typically see wingers as captains, just as a weird quirk of the game. Um, so it'd be an interesting one, just to, as a thing to watch. I think rather than we won't know the answer until Mark announces the squad. <laughs> Definitely. But in this team, like the team that you mentioned, who do you think would be the captain in this game? Um, I'll help you. Uh, uh, Lucy Staniforth, Hayley Ladd, either one of uh, Maria Thoris' daughter or uh, Aoife Manin. I'd be interested to see about Lucy Staniforth because she, she's got experience of playing with Mark at Birmingham. She's not old by any stretch of the imagination, but she's not young either. She's kind of the age that you want a captain to be at, you know. Um, and I think, you know, she, she's she got that passion and she's got that ability to sort of inspire the youth. And that's another thing as well. When you've got a younger team, as I say, we're playing our, one of our, our second team, you know, it's a harder job because you've got to inspire people a bit more. Whereas obviously... On the, when you play in a full strength squad, some people will sort their own inspiration out. There's less of a leadership requirement there. Um, so I think Lucy Staniforth. Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll go with Haley Lad. So just to make it clear to the viewers, th- we are not saying that you strip uh, Katie's LM of the captaincy. This is this captaincy thing is just being talked about the Durham game where in our predicted 11s, we are not taking Katie's LM. So please don't come into the comments and <laughs> with those. Yeah, uh, I mean, comments. the thing about Katie Zellum is, it, it, yeah, I mean, basically what I'm saying is, it's because it's seen as, as, as you were saying, anyone, anybody who's a men's fan, think of the Carabao Cup and 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 how people treat the earliest rounds. I think is it round two or round three, depending on where you're on the Premiership that they go in yeah. for the Carabao. So think about how people think about that. Think about how people, what, what team will United men put in the Carabao Cup at the beginning of the season, and what and if they got to the closer toward the end, what would they put in? And it's kind of the same with with that. I mean, I personally, I personally would would say that um, that Katie Zellum has a question mark on her, um, because as I say, I feel like she's not performing and she's only playing because she's currently captain. However, she has had periods where she has performed very well, like the beginning of the preseason and the first few game, first couple of games. Um, but she's also dipped very strongly as well. So there's a frustration there. But, you know, just like your best parent would say, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. You know, um, I, it, it's from a support element there. I want to see the Katie Zellum that we've seen in the past. And, you know, and I'd be the first person to scream her name when she does really well. Uh, but I think Katie knows herself that she's not having a good performance at the moment. And that is what the problem is with the international break is because the teams that aren't going to be involved in England, and I know obviously she may be there and thereabouts, but even if you are, it, it, it's hard to get that form and she's going to go back to Spurs, then Everton, when we come back in November. Um, but no, I'm not calling her to be stripped at the moment. I think she needs to play a bit better, but for this match particularly, to clarify, um, because she won't be playing, I don't think she's in the, in the uh, subs bench. 
uh, you'll have to nominate what we call a vice captain. Yeah. Uh, so I hopefully think we get this win because these are the kind of games where Mark really need, uh, earns his badges and, you know, he needs to perform because I think we have a shot at winning the Conti Cup considering that we only face Chelsea or Arsenal in the quarterfinals because uh, they are in the UWCL group stages. So they get a bye and they, they don't actually participate in the group stages. So, Andy, hopefully uh, three points. I think it's three or two. I don't really know what's the point, uh, you know, when we win. Yeah, that that's another weird thing. That it, yeah, it's three points for a win. It's one point, obviously, for a draw. But then, unless they've changed it, it's got this stupid quirk in it where if it's a draw after 90 minutes, it goes to extra time. And then if you... Sorry, goes to penalties. And then if you win on penalties, you get two points. So it's then because... It's Something like this happened last year when we faced City in the penalty shootout. No, no reason why. I don't understand why they've done that. A I win really is don't. a win. A win is a win. Until it's slightly less than a three-point win. Correct. So, thank you so much, Andy, for coming on. It's been a pleasure discussing you, dis discussing all the things that's been happening with women's team. Uh, yeah. Hope, so, uh, Andy, just one last question that I wanted to ask. Do you think we'll get into the top three? I think we'll get third. I think, I think, I think um, City are going one way at the moment. Hopefully for us, Gareth Taylor will stay. If you were a City fan, I'd probably be getting out by now. Um, I think that Everton are all, uh, you know, were meant to be the main challenges behind us. They've gone away, and the other teams, you know, some of them might have the squads to push us, or maybe Nick Third, but they they're going to have the problem that we have a bit of mentality. You know, we play against the top team. Sometimes we beat ourselves before the first ball is kicked because oh my god, we're playing Chelsea. Oh my god, we're playing City. Oh my god, we're playing Arsenal. So I think we're in a very very strong position. So I think we should we should get third. Same same predictions on my side. But as a United fan, I hope we win the FAWSL, but that's being a bit too far-fetched. We will know. eventually win it, I think. But yeah. we need a stronger squad and hopefully that will be at least a couple of seasons away. But, yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it's coming. It's coming. So, thank you so much, Andy, for coming on the channel. It's been a pleasure talking to you, like I said. Uh, so, do subscribe to All for United WFC and, you know, Friday Night's Fans Forum 7.30, I think it's 7 p.m. UK time. We'll catch Andy on the fans forum every Friday. And, you know, yeah, yeah. so listen to his insights because, trust me, it's it's a bit, uh, they are a bit unique. Sometimes I don't agree with them, but I get his point of view. So that's what it's all about. Uh, every Everyone is uh, entitled to their opinion and tune into All for United WFC and while you're at it to subscribe to our channel as well. So yeah, we definitely. are the United Star. Do subscribe to our channel. Check us out on our Instagram and Twitter. And we'll see you next time.